Everything we own left us this a sad and mournful song. Mary, hello. This is Donna Barnett up here in Forest Ranch, California. Yes, I'm calling to confirm my reservation to India. Yes, I have my itinerary here, and I leave at 12 noon, October 31st, and I'll be arriving in New Delhi. November. I come to the grandmother oak tree every morning to share this seed with the birds. I do this because my daughter Holly died of cancer two years ago. She was 23 years old. Some of her ashes are scattered at the roots of this tree. As you can imagine, the last two years have been extremely painful. I've struggled with the questions of what was the meaning of Holly's death and why did it happen? And is there anything I could have done to prevent it? The hardest part is the realization that she's not coming home. And sometimes I forget and I say, Holly, you've been gone long enough. And then I remember and realized that she's not coming home and my heartache returns. A Buddhist friend was aware of my pain and confusion. He suggested that this would be a good time in my life to go on a pilgrimage. I knew from having made three treks in Nepal and from my reading that people of all spiritual traditions have gone on pilgrimages at momentous times including times of loss in their lives. I therefore decided to take my friend's advice and go on a pilgrimage to the Buddhist sites in Nepal and India. I knew that being a pilgrim is different than being a tourist. The tourist travels for adventure, relaxation, and pleasant experiences. The pilgrim, on the other hand, seeks to awaken, to touch and be touched by the sacred. My purpose for going on this journey is the renewal of my faith in life. The death of my daughter was a tremendous blow to my sense of well-being and a very painful lesson in impermanence. The trip to New Delhi will take about 27 hours. I'll rest a day and then take a short flight to Varanasi.
In Varanasi, I awoke before dawn and drove through the city to the Ganges River. I was amazed and taken aback by seeing so many people and so much activity on the streets at this early hour. I decided to begin at the Ganges because it is sacred to Hindus. The god Shiva dwells here and people come from all over India to worship. Could I learn anything about pilgrimage from watching them? Because the river is sacred, the dead are cremated here, and sadhus congregate to meditate on the transience of life. Sadhus are ascetics who've given up home and family in order to attain liberation. Right now, it's hard for me to see how separation from those I love can bring anything but suffering. Many mornings, thousands of the devoted come to the river. I said that pilgrims seek to touch and be touched by the sacred. These people don't just touch it, they completely immerse themselves in it. I can see that worship and devotion are a large part of what pilgrimage is about. I don't know if I'm capable of unselfconscious devotion, but I am joining with the others and making this traditional offering to the river of candles on leaves. A Brahmin priest I met told me that the very act of making an offering to something or worshiping it with prayers and mantras imbues it with the quality of holiness. In this way, many of the things we consider ordinary, like cows, rivers, mountains, and statues, become holy to Hindus. The Ganges is venerated because it springs from the head of Shiva, the god of death and transformation. In Western mythology, the angel of death is called the Grim Reaper. He's feared and hated. Hindus don't hate Shiva, they worship him. Even the head of a dead cow, along with the remains of people cremated on the ghats, are put into the river and float freely among the worshippers. Clearly, their attitudes about death are very different than ours. Might there be something here that can help me gain a different perspective on Holly's death? Varanasi is one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities on Earth. It's a fascinating place, but I feel overwhelmed. I'll have to make a conscious effort not to brace myself against the apparent chaos and onslaught to my senses if I'm going to experience India fully. I'm happy to be leaving the city and traveling through the rural areas to Lumbini, the Buddhist birthplace in Nepal. I very quickly learned, however, that even in the agricultural areas, there are towns and people everywhere. I shouldn't have been so surprised. There are more than a billion people in India. They all have to live somewhere. The crowds are so dense in some places that it's almost impossible to drive through them. Two days after leaving Varanasi, I crossed the Indian border into the Terai area of Nepal, near Buddha's birthplace in Lumbini. Lumbini is the place in southern Nepal where Queen Mahamaya Devi gave birth to Siddhartha. With his birth, he began a pilgrimage that took him from princehood to Buddhahood. According to legend, before his birth, the future Buddha looked down from heaven and searched for the best family into which he could be born. He chose King Suddhodana and Queen Mahamaya Devi, 
rulers of what was a small kingdom near here called Kapilavastu. Before she knew she was pregnant, the queen dreamed that a beautiful white elephant, born on a lotus flower, entered her body. The dream was interpreted to mean that she would give birth to the future Buddha. The countryside through which the pregnant queen traveled, as she journeyed from Kapilavastu to the pleasure gardens at Lumbini, ten months after her dream, was probably very similar to that found in the area today. Upon reaching Lumbini, Queen Mahamaya bathed in the sacred pool. After bathing, she took hold of a branch of a saw tree and gave birth to Prince Siddhartha. He immediately took seven steps and announced, I am worthy to be honored by gods and men. This is my last birth. I shall destroy birth and decay, death and pain. I was disappointed to see that the temple that marks the spot where Mahamaya gave birth is now an archaeological site, and the tree she held onto is gone. But the area is still considered sacred. Each morning at dawn, a representative of a different branch of Buddhism, like this Mahayana priest, performs a puja or devotional service. Emperor Ashoka had this pillar erected after his visit to Lumbini in the 3rd century BC. Ashoka was the ruler who was largely responsible for the spread of Buddhism throughout India and Sri Lanka. The writing states that Buddha was born here and to celebrate the villagers had their taxes reduced. This peepal tree, similar to the one under which the Buddha became enlightened, is very prominent in the garden. Tucked away in its roots are two small statues, one of Siddhartha at the time of his birth and the other of his death. I was startled by this juxtaposition. The implication was clear. We cannot have birth without death. The truth of this is difficult to tolerate. Monks spend years contemplating this reality in order to be able to fully accept it as a fact of life. Ruins are all that remain of the many monasteries and rest houses built near the birth site over the centuries to accommodate the monks and pilgrims who came to meditate and worship. A new temporary temple was recently built to house the artifacts previously found in the Mahadevi temple. The most famous of these is this relief of the queen holding onto a branch as she gives birth to Siddhartha. Many centuries of loving touch by the devoted have erased her individual features. Now she can be any woman giving birth to a beloved child. In days past, most pilgrims traveled on foot, some walking thousands of miles and enduring many dangers and hardships to reach their destination. The modern pilgrim more commonly arrives by car, bus, or by perhaps an even more jarring mode of transportation. The minister from Mongolia and his entourage were brought to Lumbini by a Nepalese army helicopter. The peace and quiet of the area were shattered by the noisy aircraft. The minister and his group are Buddhist, and they came to Lumbini to worship and make offerings. Siddhartha grew up in nearby Kapilavastu, where he lived the life of a privileged prince. At age 29, he became aware of the inescapable realities of illness, suffering, and death. And like me, he experienced a crisis in his life. I imagine he must have been very confused and in a great deal of turmoil to make the drastic decision to leave his home and family in order to begin his quest. 
My mind was filled with the image of the statues of the Buddha's birth and death as I left Lumbini for Bodh Gaya, the place where Siddhartha became enlightened. After leaving his home and family, Siddhartha went into the forest outside Kapilavastu and for six years lived a life of extreme self-denial. Brought to the brink of death by these practices, he understood they were not the way to self-realization. When the milkmaid, Sujata, found him beside a river and offered him food, he accepted and regained his strength. Siddhartha then went to a nearby place now called Bodh Gaya. The Mahabodhi Temple, or Temple of the Great Awakening, sits atop the place where Siddhartha realized the truth and Buddhism was born. The Venerable Way Blue Achisa from Sri Lanka. This is the most important place in Buddhist world because the Lord Buddha get enlightenment here. Siddhartha sat down under the ancestor of this fig tree and according to the stories called the Jatakamala, he resolved, let my skin and sinews and bones become dry and let all the flesh and blood in my body dry up, but never from this seat will I stir until I have attained supreme and ultimate wisdom. The sacred spot where Siddhartha sat under the Bodhi tree is now called the Vajrasana or Diamond Throne. This statue inside the Mahabodhi temple depicts Siddhartha at the moment of his enlightenment. As he focused his intense powers of concentration, he understood deeply that impermanence and the fact that nothing has a separate, isolated existence are the very conditions necessary for life. Without them, nothing can change and grow. A seed couldn't become a tree, nor a drop of rain, an ocean. The long search was finished. Siddhartha had become the Buddha, and the earth shook its acknowledgement. He had seen the pervasiveness of suffering and felt a deep compassion for all beings. He also understood the cause of suffering and discovered the path to its cessation. This was the message he would bring to the world over the next 45 years. After meditating for one week under the Bodhi tree, the Buddha went up the hill where this temple is now located. He stood for one week without closing his eyes, looking back at the Bodhi tree in gratitude. The temple, called the Animeskala Kana Stupa, is one of seven holy sites at Bodh Gaya associated with the Buddha's presence in the area. The third week at Bodh Gaya, the Buddha walked up and down here, now called the Kankamana Shrine or Promenade. Lotus flowers sprung up under his feet as he walked. Bhikkhu Achisa explains to a group of pilgrims from Sri Lanka that the Buddha used the fourth week to meditate here, a few yards from the Bodhi tree. It's now called the Ratnagara Shrine. Five rays of colored lights were said to have emanated from the Buddha as he contemplated negative emotions and habits and the impermanence of the body. A banyan tree shaded the Buddha from the intense Indian sun as he meditated during the fifth week. It's near the river, a short distance from Bodh Gaya, where Sujata gave him milk and rice. Musalinda Nagaraj, the king of the serpents, raised up behind the Buddha and shielded him from a rainstorm as he meditated during the sixth week at Musalinda Lake. This tree is venerated as the place where two merchants offered the Buddha the first food he had eaten in 49 days. Afterwards, they took refuge in the Buddha and his teachings and became his first two lay devotees. Every year, thousands of people gather here. Buddhist people come here annually to worship Lord Buddha.
there is a bow tree, Lord Buddha get enlightenment, and Vajrasana. Like many pilgrims who come to Bodh Gaya, I hope to gain some new insight or new perspective by visiting this holy place. I had already learned at the Ganges and Lumbini that death need not be feared and hated, and that birth and death are inseparable. But Bodh Gaya is the place of awakening, and I couldn't help but wish for some other experience or insight that would further lessen my suffering and confusion. A stone fence surrounds the Mahabodhi temple. It was built in the second century BC. Only a few of the original posts remain. The relief on this post humorously shows a woman trying to gain enlightenment by climbing the Bodhi tree. Over the centuries, the Mahabodhi temple has itself become an object of worship. I was fascinated to see the variety of ways that the faithful express their devotion to this holy place. It's not unusual for people to do 100,000 of these prostrations. This monk prostrated himself for at least six hours a day during the three days I was at Bogaya. Another common practice involves the recitation of mantras or sacred sounds while visualizing various deities or the Buddha. The worshiper then identifies with the visualized deity and takes on his or her qualities. Pilgrims have traditionally worshipped at the Bodhi tree by reciting this prayer with devotion. Seated at whose base the teacher overcame all enemies, attaining omniscience, that very Bodhi tree do I adore. This great tree of enlightenment, reverenced by the Lord of the world, I too shall salute you. May there be homage to you, O royal Bodhi. Some of the faithful express their devotion through karma yoga, actions that benefit others and the community. These representations of the Buddha's footprints under the Bodhi tree are a good example of what the Brahmin told me at the Ganges. The prayers and faith of generations of worshippers have imbued these objects with holiness. Last night, after spending all day at the Mahabodhi temple, I had a dream. And in that dream, I was holding the lizard, and it was struggling to get away. It was kicking and biting. And all I wanted to do was take it home and care for it. Along with the other things I've learned on my pilgrimage, I believe this dream gives me yet another piece of the puzzle of how to deal with my suffering caused by Holly's death. Like the lizard in the dream, my struggle to get away from and avoid my suffering only makes it worse. With an acceptance of my loss and the feelings that it brings forth, there emerges a new trust. My emotions are experienced in the context of a greater sense of space, peace, and loving kindness. I know that I'll spend time during the remainder of my pilgrimage contemplating this and trying to understand how it fits with the other things I've learned. I left the Mahabodhi temple and explored some of the other places of interest in Bodh Gaya. 
This Bhutanese temple is one of several temples that Bodh Gaya built by Buddhist countries. The workmanship is exquisite. I've been inside many Tibetan Buddhist temples in Nepal and India, but I've never seen anything this detailed, elaborate, or colorful. The creation of the beautifully painted and sculptured reliefs that covered the walls was obviously an act of great love and devotion. They show different episodes from the Buddha's life, his birth at Limbini, the temptation by the forces of Mara at the time of his enlightenment at Bodh Gaya, and his death at Kushnagar. As I looked at this painting on the ceiling, my mind was drawn into its center. I rode by pedicab the mile or so distance from the Bhutanese temple to see an 82 and a half foot tall image of the Buddha. It was built by Japanese monks. I remember Holly speaking before she became ill of her plans to travel to Nepal and India. Because of my meditation practice and the experiences I've had on this pilgrimage, I'm now able to more fully accept the sadness I feel, realizing she will never have the opportunity to visit these places. I returned to the Mahabodhi temple in late afternoon after a short rest. As dusk approached and daylight faded, many pilgrims made offerings of candles and incense. I decided to join them. I offer this incense in memory of my daughter Holly and with compassion for all parents who have lost a child. After the two merchants took refuge in the Buddha and his teachings, he started to have doubts about whether people could understand what he had discovered. Fearing that the Buddha would not teach, the god Brahma came down from heaven and said, Have compassion for this world, O Lord. You know that there are some whose understanding is only clouded by a thin veil. You also know that there are pure souls who are yet helplessly entangled in the snares of suffering. The Buddha replied, Wide open be the doors of immortality to all who have ears to hear. May they receive the Dharma with faith. I will go and teach. The Buddha decided to find and preach to his five former companions with whom he had lived for six years in the forest. They now lived in the deer park near Varanasi. The Buddha left Bodh Gaya and walked about 150 miles to Saranath, near Varanasi. A legend in the Jataka Mala traces the origin of the deer park to a previous birth of the Buddha as a golden deer, king of a herd of deer. When the life of a pregnant roe in his herd was to be sacrificed for the Raja's plate, the golden deer offered his life instead. Greatly moved by this act of compassion, the Raja decreed that henceforth no animals in his kingdom should be killed. The Chalkhandi Stupa commemorates the place in Saranath where the Buddha rejoined his five former companions. Because they believed he had abandoned a life of asceticism, they ignored him as he approached. But when the Buddha stood before them, they were so impressed by his holy appearance that they leapt up from their seats and listened to what he had to say. He explained to them they could not attain liberation by torturing their bodies. He taught them the middle path, which he had found between a life dedicated to the pursuit of pleasure and one involving self-mortification. The Dhammak Stupa on the grounds of the deer park is said to be the place where the Buddha delivered his first sermon to the five ascetics. These teachings are known as the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. They explain the nature of suffering, 
its cause, and the path to its cessation. I had already learned some new ways of looking at suffering, and now I took the opportunity of being at Sarnath to study what the Buddha taught about this subject. As I understand what the Buddha said, life is replete with suffering. As this older gentleman must have learned, everyone's life is subject to painful experiences, illness, and death. These cannot be avoided, and for the most part, we have little or no control over them. Although the Buddha taught that the end of suffering is possible, it cannot be brought about by avoiding painful circumstances. Instead, if the cessation of suffering is to occur, it must happen by changing our attitudes toward these circumstances and our beliefs about ourselves. The method taught by the Buddha to bring about this change in our understanding is called the Eightfold Path. It's often divided into three parts, morality, wisdom, and meditation or concentration. Morality deals with our relationship with one another and with the earth. It's the foundation of the spiritual life, and its goal is to replace the roots of evil in our hearts, greed, hatred, and ignorance, with the roots of good, altruism, goodwill, and wisdom. The essence of the Buddha's teaching on morality can be summed up in three words, do no harm. Expressed positively, this means acting with generosity, loving kindness, and compassion for all beings. The second part of the Eightfold Path is concerned with wisdom. Wisdom is an acceptance of the reality that, like these ancient monasteries, all things are impermanent, and therefore no lasting happiness or security can be found in the things and ordinary experiences of this life. It is also the realization that everything is related to everything else, and nothing, including that which we call the self, has its own separate existence. Wisdom also includes an understanding of the Four Noble Truths and Eightfold Path. Meditation and concentration are the third part of the Eightfold Path. The image of the Buddha sitting cross-legged, deeply absorbed in meditation, is one of the most famous in world religious art. I thought back to the many different statues of the Buddha meditating that I had seen on my pilgrimage. Meditation and concentration are the two methods taught by the Buddha to gain direct experience of the fact that the self is constantly changing and impermanent, and that nothing in this world has a separate, independent existence. The importance of meditation in Buddhist practice can also be seen by the fact that the Buddha attained enlightenment while meditating. The Mulaganda Kuti is considered the most important shrine in Deer Park. It celebrates the place where Buddha stayed on several occasions while visiting Saranath. The shrine was built about the 6th century AD. Over the centuries, pilgrims have expressed their devotion to the Buddha by placing small pieces of gold leaf on many parts of the shrine. This is another of the many columns and other monuments built by the Emperor Ashoka in the 3rd century BC at places associated with the Buddha's life. It stands just behind the Mulaganda Kuti shrine. The writing on the column warns the monks and nuns against causing division in the Sangha, the community of ordained followers of the Buddha. I've been thinking about the new outlook on how to cope with my daughter's death that's been evolving. I now understand that my suffering results not just from her loss, but also from my belief that she shouldn't have died, especially at the age of 23. But this belief only increases my pain. I know that everyone dies, and the time of each of our deaths is uncertain. None of us is guaranteed a long life. Rather than thinking about the injustice of her death, I can choose to celebrate the joy of her having been alive and the wonderful times we did have together. Also, I learned from my dream at Bodh Gaya that whenever the painful feelings do arise, I don't have to fear them. Instead, I can mindfully attend to them without judgment, 
knowing they will be transformed in a space of loving kindness. I see also that my new understanding is growing by a series of small steps rather than coming in one blinding flash of insight. I feel confident that it will continue to evolve. My heart felt lighter as I traveled to Kushnagar, the last stop on my pilgrimage. The Buddha spent the next 45 years as a mendicant monk, meditating and teaching the Dharma throughout the countryside and towns in this area of northern India. Many people came to see him and hear his teachings, and the number of lay devotees and ordained monks and nuns grew very large. When he was 80 years old, the Buddha went to Kushnagar. Though he had become ill outside of Kushnagar, it is said that he had anticipated his death and wished to die here. This stupa and temple are believed to be the place where the Buddha instructed his disciple, Ananda, to prepare him a bed between two salt trees. He knew his earthly wanderings would soon be over. The Buddha lay down on the bed in the lion posture. He remained fully mindful and aware. When he saw Ananda's grief, he said, Do not be troubled. It is in the nature of earthly things that they must perish. Truth alone will ever remain. I have fulfilled my mission. After a few more words of preaching, the Buddha said, I declare to you, decay is inherent in all conditioned things. Apply yourself with diligence. These were his last words. Then the Buddha passed from deep meditation into Pare Nirvana, and a mighty earthquake shook the earth. Lightning flashed and thunder rolled. The Buddha was dead. The Ramabhar Stupa memorializes the place where the Buddha was cremated. It is said that the people couldn't bring themselves to part with his body. So it wasn't until the seventh day after his passing that it was carried in a great procession to this area where it was ceremoniously burned. When the ritual had been completed, his devotee, Devaputra, said, The earthly remains of the Blessed One have been cremated, but the truth he taught will live forever. Let us go out into the world and preach to all the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, Lord Buddha was uh, died uh, just uh, uh, some uh, uh, distance uh, uh, after and uh, he was uh, cremated here, at this place. Actually, uh, I feel that I have seen the God here, miss the Lord Buddha. Uh, I have seen all the stupas here, which are built by uh, uh, different uh, nations, like Japan, uh, Thailand, and uh, they were so pleasant. And I feel uh, peace of mind here, the basic thing was, that everywhere you'll find peace here. Dham Saran Gachami Dham Saran Gachami Sangam Saran Gachami Sangam Saran Gachami Dham Saran Gachami Dham Saran Gachami Dham Mam Saran Gachami Sangam Saran Gachami Dham Saran Gachami Dham Saran After the Buddha's body had been transformed by the flames, the cremains were placed into a golden vase and taken to this area, about a mile from the cremation site. Here, a decision was made to divide them among the most prominent rulers of North India. The different portions were later enshrined in stupas, where they have been worshipped by devotees for more than two millennia. 
Because I found the Indian people to be friendly and inclusive, I felt very comfortable sharing the story of my daughter's death with many of them. Quite a few responded by telling me that they too had lost a child to illness. At these moments, I understood deeply the Buddha's teaching on the universality of suffering and realized again that my loss is not unique. I also felt a strong bond with people everywhere, knowing that at some time in each of our lives we all experience the sorrow of losing people we love. But I also felt happy in the knowledge that there are people who are willing to share with me a total stranger, pleasurable as well as sorrowful experiences. It was now the fourth week in November, and the mornings were cool and foggy. An election for district officers was scheduled to take place in a few days, and loudspeakers blared music and election slogans. Looking across the street to the grounds of the Burmese temple and guest house, I could see a very large stupa being built in the distance. Burmese-style stupas are called pagodas. Having visited many stupas in Nepal, Thailand, and India, some of which are more than a thousand years old, it was very exciting for me to be present at the construction of a new one. I had often wondered about the lives of the people who had witnessed these ancient stupas being built. I now imagined that a couple of thousand years from today, people would be worshiping at this pagoda, wondering what life was like for the people who were present at the time it was built. I suspect that the tools and construction techniques used to build the stupas of long ago were not very different than those used today. I watched the construction until the fog cleared and then walked back through Kushnagar to the memorial of the Buddha's death. The street scenes, which just four weeks ago I found overwhelming, now seemed colorful and lively. Sitting here at Kushnagar, the place of Buddha's death, I've come to a deeper understanding of the impermanence of life. Even the Buddha can't avoid death. On my pilgrimage to the Buddhist holy places, I've had an opportunity to speak to many people. In sharing our stories about our life, it's become obvious everyone has had an experience of loss and suffering. I said earlier that the pilgrim's goal is to touch and be touched by the sacred. Recalling a few of the many scenes I had witnessed of pilgrims expressing open-hearted devotion, I now realize that my experience of the sacred was brought about largely by watching and participating in such devotional activities. But equally important to me is the heartfelt connection I made with both ordinary Indians and pilgrims from many parts of the world, with whom I had the opportunity to share many experiences. Having touched and been touched by them was for me the most special and healing part of my journey. I'm reminded of the story about the woman who asked the Buddha to save the life of her child. And through the skillful means of the Buddha, she realized that loss and death are a natural part of life. All of these experiences have given me a greater compassion for my own suffering and that of others. Kushnagar is the last stop on my visit to the Buddhist holy places. All that remains of my pilgrimage is for me to return home and share whatever merit and understanding I've gained on this very remarkable journey. More than five weeks have passed since I flew to India. During my journey, I spoke with many people, observed different forms of spiritual practice, 
and pass through a world of ever-changing landscapes. These experiences and more familiarity with the Buddha's life and teachings have deepened my understanding and acceptance of impermanence and suffering, realities that affect everyone's life. My loss, although painful, is not unique. It is part of the human experience. My earlier question, why did Holly die, no longer seems relevant. I now know my daughter died because she was born. In addition to these memories and insights, I've also brought back a few mementos. A stone rubbing of the Buddha's footprints, a small Buddha image from Bodh Gaya, and a garland of marigolds given to me at the Ganges in Varanasi. I'm placing them here at the Grandmother Oak as an offering. Look at this. It's winter, a time we associate with darkness and death. And already the bulbs are coming up and the mushrooms are emerging. Surely life and death are one inseparable process. You sound your horn, pound your drum, free your soul to run. Like the sun or the heat on the morn of the day when you, you were born, born of love, born of light, born of sweat and come in the night without moon to a ground that was trembling with with the sound of a drum, of a horn, on the day when you 